Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the book club. We have one more session for you today, and it proves to be a very interesting one. Now, the book club is almost 19 years old, and we're very happy that it has proved popular enough to continue in this fashion. So I said good evening to everybody, but there are people with us today for whom it is morning and rather early morning as well. So for those, good morning and welcome. Hi, Jyoti, I see you there. Very early morning for you too. So uh, welcome all of you. Now, today uh, we are going to talk about Manu Pillay's first book. Now, Manu Pillay, of course, is a name that is very well known. I'm sure there's not a single person here who would say that he hadn't heard of Manu Pillay. And uh, Manu Pillay is still a young man, uh, writing very prolifically. So there are several books out there. We see his uh, articles in newspapers. Uh, we have seen him at the JLF and in other you know, such forums. And uh, when Farooq lent me this book and I began to read it, I was actually surprised to see how beautifully, how pleasantly written it was. And what a very lovely, easy read it was. Because when you say history, I think you kind of expect a lot of facts and figures and dates being thrown at you and a little dryness of content, but uh, none of the above was true. Very pleasant reading indeed. And I know that Farooq wanted me to like the book. So I was so glad to report to him that I did indeed like it. And I passed it on to Sunita, who I guess uh, is going to try to join us. She's in Barcelona today, but she did say that she would try to join us. Uh, what is even better news is that uh, Satish spoke to Manu Pillay himself, and he said he would be happy to join us today. So we are looking forward to that. He's flying in, I think, from Bangalore, if I'm not mistaken. And I sure hope his flight is not late because we haven't been able to contact him at this moment, but I expect him to join us at any moment. Our presenter today is Shanti Menon. I've known her for many years. She was at college with me at Lady Sri Ram College. We did our English honors and our MA <clears throat> together, you know, uh, at the arts faculty. And then she went on to do a BA and she went to Syracuse and studied there. And she now lives in uh, Detroit. And she's joining us today from Detroit where she does some admirable social work. And she continues to read the way she always has. So when I mentioned this book and I mentioned that it was a tome and therefore I might not get through it, you know, although I was enjoying it, she promptly offered to present it. So Shanti, thank you so much for that spontaneous offer of yours. And uh, over to you now. Uh, you, I think everyone Hi. now, uh, one minute, everyone now switch off your uh, uh, videos and audio, audios. Uh, audios, you can switch off please, so that we can hear only Shanti uh, speaking. Thank you very much. Shanti, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just uh, uh, sharing my screen. Hold on one minute. Okay. Okay, here we go. Uh, okay, now I'm all set. So the book I'm going to talk about is The Ivory Throne by uh, Manu Pillay. It was, um, I didn't, when I, um, I read the book when it first, when it was first released, I think in 2017. Um, and it was a fascinating history for me. I am from Kerala and I, you know, uh, other than uh, snippets of Kerala history that uh, uh, I'd heard uh, from my parents growing up, um, there are a couple of history books on Kerala that are extremely dry and uh, uh, full of facts, difficult to get through. Um, I didn't really know all the uh, complexities of the history of the region. Um, 
growing up in the 60s, uh, history, the history that we were all taught in school focused more on the north. Um, the, uh, south of India is just a footnote in uh, what we were taught. So it was interesting to read the book. It was absolutely fascinating, in fact. So when Mohini asked me to do, um, if I would present the book, I said yes. Um, and I looked at it, read it a second time over, and this time I realized my uh, reaction was, oh my God, what have I committed myself to? Because this is a very, very uh, layered and textured book. It has, um, um, it talks about the relationship and the lives of two queens of the house of Travancore, but Manu also weaves in the uh, st uh, stories from the history of the region. Um, and uh, reading it, I wondered how um, someone who is not, not from that region would make sense because there are so many players and so many uh, uh, situations in that book and all of the intricacies, names of places, names of people, a lot of the names are similar, how one wraps one's head around it. Uh, so in looking at it, um, uh, in uh, looking at the book, I thought, you know, why uh, instead of going through all uh, of it and trying to make sense of it, I would just pick on one particular theme. And since the central story of the book is the story of the two sisters, um, that is the story that I am going to focus on. And I'm not going to, in a 30 minute presentation, it's not possible to start at the beginning and talk about the arrival of Vasco da Gama and his influence and how he unleashed, uh, uh, you know, a whole era of violence. Uh, Vasco da Gama followed by the Dutch and the British and, and the violence that they created um, um, in, in the region and how, uh, you know, a thriving port community was practically decimated because of you know, what the Europeans did. Um, it's the same story everywhere in India. And so it's, I didn't want to start, I'm not starting with any of that or going back into the history of Travancore. I'm going to start with the story of the two, uh, I'm going to focus on the story of the two sisters. Um, to understand their story and to understand the history of Travancore or of any of the ruling uh, families in Kerala, it is important to understand the matrilineal kinship system, which was uh, uh, prevalent among the two uh, upper, uh, of the upper caste in Kerala. It was not uniform across the whole state. Uh, it was only the Kshatriyas or the Maharajas, the ruling uh, family, and the Nairs who uh, were matrilineal. The Brahmins were not, and neither were the Iravas or any of the lower, uh, lower caste. They were all matrilineal. Um, and it's important to make a distinction, um, that, uh, and I would like to do that, that matrilineality does not mean matriarchy. Um, matrilineal is really about lineage. So a family unit usually consisted of women, their male and female children. And uh, lineage was always traced from mother to her children. Uh, fathers uh, were kind of insignificant. Uh, they did not have much to do with the family. Um, uh, yeah, but though lineage was traced through women and uh, Kerala had very large joint families uh, called Tarawads, power was still vested in men. Um, so, um, you know, there's, uh, uh, there's a misapprehension that uh, um, matrilineality gave women a lot of power and agency. It didn't. It, uh, uh, it did not impose the kind of restrictions on women that patrilineality does. Um, women had a lot of control, uh, had some measure of control, and uh, they did, uh, you know, they had uh, more freedoms than um, uh, uh, women did in patrilineal networks because they never left their home. Um, they always stay, lived in the natal family and they lived with brothers, not with husbands. So, you know, we didn't have things like uh, spousal abuse and all of that was unknown during that time. But uh, women was, did not have a lot of agency. A lot of time men did use women to further their interest in uh, setting up relationships. Um, 
uh, Kerala society at that time was also polyandrous, which meant that uh, women could have multiple partners and men used that, like I said, um, uh, you know, women could not just go out and choose who they wanted to have relationships with. It was often mediated by the men in their family. Um, so the royal line of succession in Travancore worked with uh, um, uh, the senior most male and female members of the matrilineal lineage were the heads of the family. And they had uh, equal rights. They had equal privileges. Um, they had, even though the administration and the decision-making in the kingdom was done by uh, the male ruler, the women uh, um, exercised a lot of control and authority and they could uh, manipulate events um, if they wanted to, if they so desired. Um, and people treated them with the same respect and they were held on par with the monarch. Uh, the succession passes uh, passed from the uh, ruler to his nephew, that is his sister's sons, um, or his sister's daughter's sons, but it was always through the female line, uh, not through the male line. And marital relationships were completely secondary. Uh, when the, um, the men in the family in the royal household married, their wives were not known as, they were not queens, they were not consorts. The term that was used is Amachi, that is the mother of my children. And once the ruler died, that was it. She had, you know, she was relegated to wherever she came from, uh, probably given a pension, but, and her children, she and her children really had nothing much to do with the royal family after that. Um, and in the case of women, the spouses were always secondary because this was royalty. They, there could be no one above them. And so the men had to, they had to walk behind their wives. They uh, could not sit uh, in public next to their wife, uh, with their wives. If they went out in a carriage, uh, they, they usually they couldn't ride with their wives, but with, if they did, um, they had to sit across from them, but not next to them. So there were a lot of restrictions and stipulations. Um, a spouse had to know his place, and it was very clear that the spouse's place was not uh, next to the members of the royal family, whether it be male or female. Um, in 1890, the Travancore royal household faced a crisis because um, it was... It, it's not a family, uh, the royal family is not one where there are a lot of members, um, unlike the neighboring state of Cochin, which had uh, the kingdom of Cochin, there were multiple, uh, you know, uh, the uh, people ascended, men ascended the throne at the age of 70 and 80. In Travancore, that was not the case. In 1890, there were only four members in that family. There was the senior Rani Lakshmi Bai, and then there were her three nephews, Maharaja Mulam Tirunal, his brother uh, who was the ruler in waiting, Chatham Tirunal, and then the youngest Prince Ashwadi Tirunal. And once the, uh, uh, Lakshmi Bai didn't have any children of her own, and these were her sister's children. And once all four of them passed away, there was really nobody to rule. The lineage was gone. And Travancore had long established a tradition of adopting from uh, other uh, families, other uh, ruling families uh, in the area. And uh, Rani Lakshmi by herself, as was her sister, was adopted from the Kilimanur um, uh, um, a branch of the family. And, uh, um, you know, uh, these uh, um, uh, uh, Kshatriya families, the uh, uh, noble families vied with each other when uh, the question of adoption came up because then they could sort of have the, the uh, ruling lineage was part of their uh, blood. So in 1890, uh, the senior Rani Lakshmi Bai decided she was going to go in search of girls to adopt because uh, adopting boys didn't make sense if you want to uh, keep a lineage going. Um, you know, the lineage would just end with them. So she needed two girls and who did she turn to? She turned to her brother's family, and her brother was Raja Ravi Varma, the painter. And uh, she looked to see if he had, uh, you know, he had children, he had daughters, he had three daughters, and she thought that would be the perfect uh, um, family to adopt from. It created a lot of unrest because um, 
uh, there were other people who wanted their daughters adopted and they said, you know, she, she was being, uh, you know, this was nepotism and uh, she and her sister had had their chance and why should it be um, Ravi Varma's granddaughters, why not one of their own? But she was, she was a very smart lady, Rani Lakshmi Bai, including from her second nephew who said these were his cousins, you know, uh, Rani Lakshmi, the nephew was Rani Lakshmi Bai's sister's son. And he said, no, you know, we don't want anyone from that family because uh, there was uh, Raja Ravi Varma's wife who was very, very unhappy, a, a woman uh, became an alcoholic, as did one of her sons. So he said, they have bad blood in them. We don't want them. But she overruled all of them. And she uh, managed the adoption of two granddaughters. One was Seth Lakshmi Bai, the older one. She was the daughter of Mahaprabha. Um, and the granddaughter of Ravi Varma. And the second was Setu Parvati by daughter of Kochukunyi, who was the uh, uh, granddaughter. She also, both the, both the girls were granddaughters of Ravi Varma. So uh, the beginning was inauspicious in a state where uh, auspiciousness and omens and black magic and all of that is so predominant. The sisters had a very unhappy uh, beginning. The adoption had a very unhappy beginning because within months of the adoption, uh, Ashwati Tirunal, the second, uh, the heir apparent died. Uh, eight months later, the uh, sorry, Ashwati Tirunal was the youngest brother. Um, eight months later, the heir apparent, L.A. Raja Chadem Tirunal died, and 10 days later, Rani Lakshmi Bai passed away. Um, so that left only the two girls and the Maharaja. Um, everybody else was gone. So in a sense, the adoption was timely. It created a lot of talk in uh, the kingdom. Some people said the girls just brought bad luck. Um, others uh, who were more progressive said, no, there's no such thing as bad luck. It was probably, uh, there's a conspiracy in place. Maybe these people were poisoned and uh, uh, whatever it was, the adoption was done. It was done in the presence uh, in, in the temple and there was no going back. So the early years for the sisters was extremely difficult. Uh, Lakshmi Bai, at the age of five, was elevated to the status of senior Rani. And uh, um, the royal family in Travancore followed very, very, they had very strict rules. They, uh, there was a 12 volume book of royal protocol, which the two sisters had to follow. Everything was about protocol, ceremony, and rituals. Relationships were all formalized. So here were these two girls, you know, Granny Lakshmi Bai was five, and I think her sister was, uh, her cousin was three. They were taken away from their families and put into this place. There was no uh, great aunt who they knew was gone. And, um, uh, you know, they were, they were surrounded by palace protocol. Um, the palace then came to an arrangement that one of the mothers, not both, just one of the mothers, uh, and they would take turns, could come and stay with the girls. So either Mahaprabha or her uh, uh, sister would come and spend six months so that both the girls got to spend equal amounts of time with their mothers. And uh, Mahaprabha was one of those very um, stiff upper lip kind of women, and she spent a lot of time uh, with Lakshmi Bai telling her how to behave, what her, uh, uh, what it meant to be a senior Rani. So it, uh, and uh, one of the things that she emphasized with this young girl was to suppress her emotions. You don't reveal what you are thinking. Um, keep, you know, distance yourself. Don't get emotionally involved with people. Um, you are the queen, you, uh, you are the senior Rani. You have to be above everyone else. And because of protocol and all of this, um, uh, keeping people at a distance, the girls led very lonely lives. Um, they couldn't move out anywhere. They couldn't go anywhere. They were sort of really um, uh, constrained by uh, what was expected of them. And, her, and she found that her relationships with all the people in her life from her past had become very, very formal. Um, she, uh, she was very, uh, Rani Lakshmi Bai was very close to her father, but he could not just drop in. She could not invite him. She had to command his presence. And when he came, she would sit on the throne and he would stand in front of her. So there was that distance. 
her sisters. It was the same thing with her siblings. Her mother was allowed to come in public. Her mother had to keep her distance because this was the senior Rani. Uh, um, and uh, uh, but um, uh, there was some uh, element of closeness. But Mahaprabha was one of those women who felt that duty and obligation and keeping up a front was much more important. So, so uh, Sedu Lakshmi Bai had a very um, isolated childhood. Both Ranis did. More so in the case of Sedu Lakshmi Bai, she became a very introverted child, a reflective child, one who did not display. Um, any sort of emotion. You couldn't tell what she was uh, thinking. She was also a very beautiful woman. So people were uh, both as a child and as an adult woman. And so people were very captivated by her. But uh, uh, it served her later in life because um, uh, people, uh, when she became the regent, people um, took her for a fool, someone who they could manipulate to their detriment because she was not a fool. She was extremely bright. She was very bookish. She made it a point to learn uh, uh, about the administration of the uh, um, uh, country. And uh, she was one of the best rulers in Chapel Court. Um, then at the, at the age of five and three, the education of the girls started. They were taught Malayalam, Sanskrit, and English, history, geography, and arithmetic. And then uh, because um, uh, Travancore was a British protectorate. There was a British resident who oversaw everything. It, they felt it was very important that the girls have to have um, European education. So tennis and croquet, music, painting, embroidery. In the evenings, the girls would sit with their uh, tutors and uh, uh, read or do embroidery, emulating the European girls of that time. And they also had... Um, a white woman, a, a British woman who came and taught them aesthetics and etiquette. Um, and uh, it was, um, what was interesting is that Kerala at that time, and uh, you know, Travancore is part of Kerala, but Travancore was also a very ca uh, caste ridden, uh, very, there was a very rigid caste hierarchy. Um, and uh, not only could people not um, touch people or interact, they also had to keep a certain distance from people of a low, people of a lower caste had to keep a certain distance from um, uh, people of the upper caste. And you know there were extreme rules of pollution. So if the shadow of a lower caste person fell on that of an upper caste person, the upper caste person had to go and take a bath because you had to remove that pollution. Um, so. Um, the, Ran, uh, the two Ranis now had to meet with Europeans because they, you know, they were uh, particularly uh, uh, Lakshmi Bai because she's the senior most Rani and there were Europeans who came. So uh, what the palace did is they would arrange all of the meetings in the morning because if she shook hands with them, um, she would be polluted and uh, had to go take a bath. And during the middle of the day, if that happened, it was very inconvenient, it cut into her day. So all meetings with Europeans were held in the mornings and where the non-Europeans were concerned, there was no question of touching her. So uh, she was safe. Then at 10 years old, they decided, of course, the purpose of um, uh, adopting these two girls was uh, to create a lineage. And so they decided, the um, ruler decided that um, they, it was time to get them married. Um, and so Lakshmi Bai had to choose between, um, you, you know, they went far and wide. People were, oops, sorry. Uh, people were uh, uh, suggested a, a lot of men. And the Maharaja finally chose uh, two brothers. There was Raja Raja Varma and Rama Varma. The two brothers were presented to this little 10 year old girl, and she was told she could choose one of them as her husband. Um, Raja Raja Varma was older. Uh, he was about 10 years older than her. He was studying in college. He was a very charismatic person, tall, good looking, um, a very charming young man, very um, um, outgoing. And everyone in the palace thought he would be the perfect fit. Because they wanted to give her a choice, they said, OK, let's just tag on the younger brother as well. Because uh, uh, you know, it was a foregone conclusion. When Raja Raja Varma was there, you know, you, who would want to look at somebody else? So they tagged on his younger brother, Rama Varma, who was about 13 at that time, a very shy young man uh, who came from uh, uh, 
uh, you know, who was not exposed to uh, uh, the sophistication and the westernization of um, um, uh, Trivandrum. He had not traveled from his home, uh, from his small home region, unlike his older brother who was studying in Chennai, uh, Madras at that time and was in college. Uh, and uh, Sedu Lakshmi Bai was told to choose between the two brothers. And uh, of course, she was there, her aunt, her cousin, everybody stood, looked at the two men and they uh, compared it and, um, you know, and they said, okay, you know, now this is the older brother. And she said, no, I think I want to marry Ramavarma, which was a shock to people. Uh, they couldn't understand why, and she, but she was very adamant. She said, no, that's the man I want to marry. And later on, much, much later in life, she told, uh, the, she told one of her grandchildren that, she was very intimidated by Raja Raja Varma. Uh, she was a 10 year old girl. She said the younger brother looked, you know, kind and sensitive and sweet. And the older one seemed very confident. And she felt uh, she just didn't think she could. She, she was just intimidated by this older man. Um, and so uh, she chose um, uh, Rama Varma as her spouse. And um, Setu Parvati Bai, when it was her turn, was presented with five potential husbands and decided to ma and married her cousin Ravi Varma. Her cousin it was actually her grandfather's nephew. Ravi Varma uh, had the same name. He was ten years older than her, and but he was very good looking. And she just went. Um, the two the two cousins had very interesting marriages. So once the two they had picked their husbands and the wedding took place, um, the girls were very young, so they didn't. Uh, uh, you know, the marriage was never consummated at that time. Yeah, the uh, interim was spent in grooming these two men to fit into the royal family. So there was this whole process where they were taught uh, Western etiquette. They had to learn English. Um, they were taught how to dress um, uh, in in a manner that befitted the royal family. Uh, there was a whole process of several years that went on where these men, they were taught games like tennis and hunting. Um, in fact, um, Rama Varma became a very avid hunter. And uh, uh, so they were groomed to fit in uh, to the royal um, uh, family. It was, the marriage was a very important landmark in uh, Sedu Lakshmi Bai's life because uh, now she had someone she could get close to other than her mother. And uh, um, she did away with the palace protocol that dictated the role of a spouse. So um, where people were concerned, she, you know, when she went out on uh, among uh, the population in carriage, she insisted that her husband ride with her and he sat next to her. And people were horrified, and they uh, and uh, when she, um, as when she became the regent, and when she got older, she would never meet with men without her husband being present. And little by little, people felt that he was the one who was in control, and he was making you know he had too much of an influence in, on her life, and she didn't, but she really didn't care. She said, "This is who she is." Um, unlike say to Parvati Bai, who kept her husband in place like he could not in public he could not sit uh with her he had to stand and he had to stand at a certain distance he had to be respectful um he had to call her uh, you know your highness uh, so the way the two women treated their husbands was very very different and that also reflected on their marriage uh whatever problems say to lakshmi bai may have had in her marriage stayed with behind closed doors it was between her and her husband but say to parvati bai's uh, marital problems were all out in the open and it uh, her husband walked out on her she had many affairs and people were um it, it was you know it provided fodder for and gossip for um, uh, the uh, population in Trivandrum uh, at a time. It was quite exciting. Ravi Varma walked out and um, they had to be, uh, you know, cajoled back. Uh, and there was a lot of drama in her life. Um, the two cousins were very, very different in terms of personality from each other. Lakshmi Bai was private, bookish. She was very measured and restrained, very, very conventional. She was almost Victorian in, uh, uh, in her view of the world, of a woman's place in the world. And of, uh, given that she was from a matrilineal family, the relationship between husband and wife, um, and she was also very cautious. 
Parvati Bai, on the other hand, was rebellious. She was outspoken. She was uh, adventurous. She championed a lot of lost causes. She was forward thinking. Uh, Tedu Lakshmi Bai also, she was very pragmatic, but she was very cautious. And people didn't know what she was thinking. Um, and so um, the two um, um, cousins had very different personalities and they left their imprint. So whereas uh, Parvati Bai was the subject of gossip, she, you know, she would flaunt her relationships with men. Um, Sedu Lakshmi Bai never had relationships outside of her marriage. And so for where the kingdom was concerned, Lakshmi Bai was the ideal um, role model. She was the one that everyone thought was, you know, the ideal wife, the ideal queen, the ideal daughter. She was the ideal everything, unlike Setu Parvati Bai, who was uh, seen as the black witch. Um, and then I don't have the date for this, but then the king died. And um, yeah, but before that, there was a lot of pressure on the two women once they got married to have children. Uh, and not just daughters, but sons, because daughters, by the time the daughters grew up and had children of their own, um, it would, you know, there would be a vacuum in the succession. Um, and unfortunately, Lakshmi Bai had a couple of miscarriages, and uh, um, for a long time, she thought she wouldn't have children. Sedu Parvati Bai, meanwhile, had two daughters and a son. And finally, eventually, when she thought, uh, you know, uh, when Lakshmi Bai had sort of resigned herself to not having children, she did have two daughters. But uh, Parvati Bai beat her to it, and she had a son who was going to be the ruler after the current Maharaja died, uh, which he did. But the ruler was very, um, uh, the little boy was about 13 when his uncle died, and he was not old enough to become Maharaja. So uh, needed a regent and who and according to Kerala's matrilineal system a tradition the oldest female member the senior Rani would take on the role of regent. Now unlike um, other states there were uh, I think Mysore was one um, uh, where uh, the mother of the um, uh, heir apparent was the regent but they were just regents uh, they were token figureheads uh, the British set up a council of regency with um, uh, the mother of the uh, future Maharaja as the head, uh, but she was only a representative. It was just a token position, and the decisions were taken by the council of regents. Uh, the women were mere figureheads. They were not members of the royal family by blood. They were members of the royal family by marriage, and so um, the power that they had was very limited. But that was not the case with Sedu Lakshmi Bai. She did not owe her position as the senior Rani to marriage. Um, you know, there was no such thing as the husband has died, there's a new king, and so her position uh, was, um, she was demoted. She was the senior Rani and would, and as long as she was alive, she would continue to be the senior Rani. It did not matter um, who the king married, irrespective of all of that. Um, she was entitled to rule according to the matrilineal laws of the time. Uh, there was nothing that said that the king had to be a man, so she could rule um, in his place, but the British were very keen that they had to have a male ruler. Um, she had the same standing and authority as the men, and she was the head of the family. So when the question of regency came up, um, Parvati Bai, this was her son, she wanted a council of regents set up with herself as the head because she was the mother of the future king, uh, of the king. And um, Sedu Lakshmi Bai uh, said, no, I am the senior most uh, Rani in, in the kingdom and I should be the regent. I should rule in his place till he attains majority at the age of 18. So this went back and forth. Um, there was a lot of precedence in uh, uh, Travancore State for this arrangement of the senior Rani taking on that position. And the junior Rani tried for years, for many, many years to overturn this. She made petitions to the um, viceroy. She wrote to uh, several people. She tried to go to the press to badmouth the um, uh, Lakshmi Bai, but not, nothing of that, and nothing worked. And um, there was the big undercurrents of animosity between the cousins because um, 
Parvati Bai resented her secondary position. She resented the fact that she had to, um, that she was expected to visit the senior Rani, that she had to be deferential. Um, uh, and it was hidden, but now with the question of the Regency, it came, became a full-blown affair. Um, it got to a point where at one particular time, they, um, uh, pa uh, Parvati Bai got a bunch of keys and decided to do organize a black magic ritual. Um, Kerala families at, in that period, you know, when there, when there were family squabbles, every family has a story about black magic and somebody that performs black magic on somebody else. Um, and in fact, there were even ru rumors that uh, Parvati Bai's mother had done some black magic rituals so that Lakshmi Bai wouldn't have children, wouldn't have sons or wouldn't have children. Um, so she did this elaborate uh, black magic ritual, um, uh, hoping that it would lead to the death of Lakshmi Bai. And she also wanted her son declared uh, mentally unstable so that she could rule till her daughters had done sons. And uh, she tried to keep it very secret, but the palace was full of spies and word got out to the British uh, uh, resident uh, who was uh, in charge of overseeing and keeping things in order. And um, ultimately what happened was people just thought she was, uh, she was crazy. Uh, it didn't do her any good when word got out of this, but um, um, she, she went from pillar to post. She was in Chennai. She talked to newspaper editors, hoping that they would, uh, that she could get scurrilous stories about Lakshmi Bai and her consort, her husband. Uh, nobody was willing to publish. The stories went back to the resident. It went back to Lakshmi Bai, and it was a futile effort. Uh, say the Lakshmi Bai's regency was one of, there was a lot of problems in the state at that time, but it was also a time of, uh, she brought in a lot of progressive reforms. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Kerala was a state with, a, you know, with a very, very rigid caste hierarchy. And the only people who were allowed in the temples in Kerala were the Nayars, the Shakyas, and the Brahmins, the Iravas. Uh, and anyone, anyone below the Nair did not have access to um, uh, the temples. And the Iravas and the lower castes had been fighting for that. Uh, they, uh, they, in fact, not only were they not allowed into the temples, they were not allowed uh, within a certain square radius of the temples. They could not approach the temples at all. Um, it culminated in uh, the Vaikun Satyagraha where, um, uh, and Gandhiji was involved in that where, uh, uh, there was a, a march led by uh, Hindus to open the Vaikim Mahadeva temple to all the Hindus. And uh, um, Lakshmi Bai, in spite of the advice that she got from everybody, met with the protesters, heard their demands, and finally said that, yes, you know, the streets on the north, south, and west of the temple could be, uh, was open to all Hindus, uh, but not the main east gate and temple entry was regulated. They could not come into the temple, but they could stand outside at the distance and pray. Um, her nephew, when he became the king, in fact, changed all that and threw open all of the temples to um, anyone who is a Hindu, irrespective of caste. And interestingly, though Lakshmi Bai uh, initiated this reform and she uh, started the ball rolling, when uh, the uh, Temple Entry Act came in in the 1930s and the temples were open to everybody, she protested very loudly along with all of the conservative Hindus in Travancore. And she never went to a temple after that for the rest of her life. She never went to a temple in Kerala because she said she would not pray at a temple that allowed access to the lower caste. So there's a very interesting contradiction in uh, um, in the way she approached some of these social issues. She was, uh, she was comfortable giving some concessions. And in theory, she said that everybody has a right to pray at the temples, that God belongs to everyone. But when the temples were actually thrown open, uh, like a lot of um, upper caste Hindus of that uh, time period who stopped going to the temples because they said they would not pray in a temple uh, that allowed the lower castes uh, to come in and pray. She was also um, instrumental in supporting and pushing the Naya regulation of 1925 that abolished matrilineal. Um, 
because there were, uh, in uh, Travancore there was a push from a lot of people that uh, the and there's a long history as to why the matrilineal uh, tradition died down and I don't want to take up time because that's um, outside the scope of this uh, presentation but uh, it uh, heralded the end the moment they changed uh, um, uh, the family set up and inheritance laws and said um, traditionally in a matrilineal uh, system uh, in her, uh, the family unit was uh, uh, together. And so the only people who could inherit were the children of the women. And they kept that uh, in, uh, inheritance. Uh, the sons of the men had no rights in their, to their uh, paternal inheritance. The, every, all inheritance came through the mother. But with the abol abolition of the matrilineal, it meant that uh, uh, the children of the sons of the family could inherit what they, uh, they began in small increments, what inherit what their father had, inherit, uh, had made. So <clears throat> earlier what happened was if a Nair or a Kshatriya man went out uh, and, um, you know, did, uh, uh, earned an income, it would move back into the, uh, into the Tarwar, the matrilineal um, household. He, he could not pass it on to his children. They had no rights to it. His nephews and nieces had rights to it. But with an IR regulation, it said that if men had individual incomes that did not belong to the joint family, they could pass it on to their sons. And, that, um, and they said that sons have a right to inherit from their fathers. And that was one of the first... Uh, uh, steps towards the breakup of matrilineal, and slowly, you know, over the decades, uh, the um, old matrilineal communities in Kerala have start have moved towards patrilineality now. Um, she also expanded opportunities for women and all the castes and religions in education and employment. Before her time, employment was based on patronage. Um, but she said, no, we will give jobs to those who are the most qualified, who are the most competent. And when she was pregnant and she also suffered from tuberculosis, her doctor was uh, Dr. Mary Punan, uh, and who was a Christian, who at normal times would not have been allowed to touch or even have anything to do with uh, a member of the royal family. And she said, and she sort of elevated uh, her um, and gave her very responsible positions in the government. She had uh, um, judges who were uh, women, Christian women. And so she opened it up. She set up a women's college in Trivandrum that uh, um, taught a lot of academic subjects. Um, and so she opened up education and employment. And so a lot of communities took uh, advantage of that. Um, and that uh, again, led to the expansion of education. She set up schools so that there was always one school to every thousand people in uh, the state of Kabbalah. Uh, following the regency, the regency was for a very limited time. And, one, and during the period of her regency, she introduced all of these reforms. She was very popular with the, pop with the general population in the kingdom. Uh, but not with the powers, uh, the Brahmins and the Nayas who felt that, uh, you know, they wanted to curtail what she was doing. They did not agree with the temple entry program. They, uh, you know, they did not like uh, uh, opening up access to government jobs to everyone uh, based, uh, and opening it up based on merit rather than patronage. So there was a lot of uh, disaffection. And then the in that period, her relationship with Sedu Parvati Bai and her nephew Shri Chitra really deteriorated because it got to a point where they could not even bear to see each other. She would send for them, they would not come or they would drag their heels. Um, um, uh, Sedu Parvati Bai would invite the queen for religious uh, festival, uh, festivals like Onam and Vishu, but she would not invite uh, Lakshmi Bai's husband. And Lakshmi Bai would say, uh, you know, would, said she would not go unless uh, her husband was included and say to Parvati Bai's point was he's not uh, a member of our household, he's not royal. And, uh, and so, no, I don't want to include him. And so that created a lot of uh, um, uh, um, anger and led to a lot of pettiness on um, uh, the part, on, bo on both sides actually, um, because, um, uh, um, 
Tedu Parvati Bai and the Maharaja Chitra Thirunal felt that she laid, uh, uh, that her loyalties lay with her spouse when it should have been with her lineage and that she, in a way, she was letting them all down. So once she, the regency was over and she Chitra Thirunal at the age of 18, he was 13 when she became regent. Uh, he was 19. In fact, they extended the regency uh, by one year. At the age of 19, when he became the king, um, they really took, got their back on her. They cut down her pension. They, uh, she wanted a 21 gun salute. They said, no, they, they wouldn't give her that. They really clipped her wings and made her, she had to beg for everything that she wanted. She wanted staff. They wouldn't provide the staff. They wouldn't provide the money for the staff. Um, it went back and forth. And uh, 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 when she had uh, two daughters, Lakshmi, um, by her two daughters, and Sri Chitra Tirunal would uh, um, summon them to visit him in the palace. And as the ruler, she could not keep them away. She had, she had to send the daughters, so her husband would take them. And she, as the senior Rani, it was uh, not done for her to go visit her nephew. He was to come and visit her because there was that age hierarchy. And... Um, uh, she was the senior most member of the family, so she couldn't take the girls, but her husband would take the girls and he would be made to stand outside and Achitra um, Tirunal would meet with his nieces and, uh, you know, he and, and the girls said that really he would ask them a few questions. How are you doing? What are you studying? And then he would just keep them sitting there in order really to uh, to send a point to their father who was standing outside and the father was not allowed to sit. He had to stand outside and wait. And he, he would keep the girls and then send them back. So um, there were these periodic visits and she hated uh, that her husband should be treated this way, but there was nothing that they could do given uh, the times. Um, so she struggled, struggled uh, uh, with uh, you know, all of the restrictions placed on her, the vindictiveness, the meanness. Um, uh, India became independent, the kingdom was merged and uh, um, the last blow for her was when her uh, staff in her palaces became unionized and she treated her staff very well. They were well paid. Um, she took very good care of them, but they formed in union and there, were talk of, there was talk of violence. They demonstrated outside her front door and uh, her children who had by then gotten, her daughters were married at that time and had moved out. One was in Chennai, the other was in Bangalore felt it was not safe for her to live in Trivandrum anymore. So they um, moved her out to, uh, decided to move her to Bangalore. And so um, one, one day she just, you know, the government, they, uh, the daughters arranged for her to move. And on the way, it's, uh, her husband tells the story of uh, when they were driving away from the palace, he asked her whether she would like to turn back and look at the palace. And she said, no. And she stopped at the temple, the Padmanabha Swami temple, and she gave her driver some money and said, you know, to, she didn't go into the temple, but she told him to drop it in the hundi and to say prayers for her. Um, so, and then she moved to Bangalore and that was it. She never went back to Trivandrum after that. Um, and as Manu Pillay says, in the final years of her life, she spent most of her time in a small room watching the dusk slip in and out of a series of windows. Um, this, it's also interesting that after she, uh, you know, she stepped down as the regent, um, she had brothers who, um, she was a very family-centered woman, and she was very fond of her siblings. And she had brothers who were married to Nair women, and they would come and stay at the palace. Um, and she entertained them, and she loved having all of the family. She was very fond of her sisters-in-law. Uh, but when it came time to meal times, uh, the Nair women had to eat separately. They were not allowed to eat with royals. Um, so the, she still, and she adhered to that. She insisted on that. So in many ways, she, she was a very traditional woman, though she introduced a lot of progressive measures in the state. Um, I want to, uh, and then Sri Chitra Tirunal took over. He had a younger brother. Um, 
the family was beset with a lot of problems. It was during his reign that we they had um, uh, the Sri Padmanabha Swami um, temple was, they opened up the vaults and all of the gold and the jewels came out and all of those uh, court cases came up. So um, in 2011, what the family did was they got a whole bunch of uh, Brahmin astrologers to come into the temple and do a puja and to cast an astrological chart to see what was it in the stars that was uh, that had brought on all of this bad luck on the family in this um, uh, century. And uh, one of the things that came up was that they said that a queen of this dynasty who ruled the land and worshipped this deity was forced to leave in tears and it is her curse that haunts the family and uh, the a queen who was forced to leave is Lakshmi Bai who uh, uh, really though her life was comfortable was still you know but it was she had no trappings it was all gone people didn't remember her she's kind of a forgotten figure even though as uh, the region, she's one of the most, uh, one, uh, a very important figure in Travancore history. So that concludes my presentation. Very interesting. Yeah. Practically sounds like a Hindi movie story. Yes. <laughs> it does. Yes. yes. Okay. Well put, Shanti. Very I mean, beautiful. there was all, uh, you know, all kinds of black magic and um, uh, it's, uh, it's fascinating. I mean, I can relate to it because, I mean, growing up, I used to hear stories and you know, night families were full of all of this. Um, uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to ask Black magic all of and curses and going to astrologers and finding out, you know, what is happening, etc. Okay, I'm going to ask all of you to uh, start your video so that we can see you. Yes. If you have questions, and you can ask your questions. Moini, yes. any questions Just from you? Uh, Farooq has his hand up, so let Farooq, him speak. Please, I don't Farooq. have. Anyway, I don't have my hand up, but I will just say that the president, the book is so big, and you know, Shanti had a. I could see chunks of that book being left away by Shanti. So I, I think justice would have been done if if she would have been able to get some more time because there's many things in the book about the Syrian Christians and about yes. the history of all the way the. She tried to explain the lineage part, but I think the main many of the main stories. Oh, she was not able to. I'm very sorry, Shanti. Yeah. You know, I was told thought, 30 minutes, and I've already gone to 50. Yeah, but, uh, I could yes. see and that all I said was that she just... opened it up. She all I could do was say that she opened up, uh, my, uh, you know, um, opportunities for minorities across all communities. Yeah, one of the uh, things, no, uh, Shanti, was that during the end of uh, Lakshmi, uh, Lakshmi, uh, before she died, the both sisters met each other. Actually, yes. they met each other. There's a photograph of them meeting each right. other. Right, there is a so, photograph. Yeah, yeah, and they are they are looking very distant to each other, but yet they are meeting on one. They are sitting on one. Yeah, and that was a solitary occasion. I there don't was, think anything. After 27 uh, years, they met. You know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, I got a message from uh, uh, Mani. Manu. Uh, Manu. Manu. He's. Uh, uh, he's got a very bad eye infection and he was at the doctor's and he's trying to leave next week, that early next week. So he seems to be very worried. But he's promised me, next time we want him, he will again come. Okay? So uh, wish him all the very best. Okay, any other questions for guys? Come along. Jyoti, good to see you. Hi there. Jyoti, can't hear you. You need to unmute. Okay, okay, okay. I thought I had unmuted it. It's nice to be here. And it's nice to, uh, um, I did not read the full book, but I have read a few portions of it. And Ms. Menon has presented it so beautifully, though, you know, I think one of the listeners was saying that certain parts are left out, but I think it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't, I really doesn't enjoy it. You can't. Yeah. You can't uh, a big talk like that. You can't put it down. Put it in for forty-five minutes or any other yeah, time. There has to be selection, and Shanti yes. has her selection. 
it's yeah. very complicated book anyways <laughs> latika right. oh by the by the way uh, jyoti is, is talking from uh, uh, from uh, canada you know why i am saying it is complicated because it had uh, uh, the previous centuries uh, so much was happening in calicut and you know in kerala so i think all those things all those events had affected they had influenced whatever the way the, this uh, matriarchal society was running um, okay uh, the interestingly the book is being made into a film um yes bahubali uh, i no i think Bahu, it's uh, by the same director who directed bahubali but um, it's um, i don't know when it will come up but i think they're in the process of negotiating that so Latika, you, i mean is it is it very well suited uh, to become a movie shanti what do you think i think so because i think it's got all that drama and you know all the it's got uh, battles you've got battles I've kept you've got it out. so far between be the two sisters so yes yeah can i ask you a question uh, shanti sure yeah uh, there was someone called balachandran i think who had uh, oh, let, first uh, let latika speak yeah. then balachandran can come in yes okay. uh you know the fact that the kerala society is matrilineal is known uh, the conflict that comes out in this book is uh, that it's matrilineal on the one hand the woman has a certain role to play at the same time the power is with the man yes. now uh how is it in kerala today is it similar yeah, very patrilineal is you know i um, grew up in a family i'm from kerala and i'm an ayur i grew up in a family where the ethos was very much shanti speak closer to the mic uh, yeah i grew up in a family where the ethos was very can you hear me now yeah yeah, yeah. 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 where the ethos was very uh, matrilineal you know both on my father's side and on my mother's side but now i can see with each successive generation um it's becoming like the rest of india it's coming very patrilineal yeah pani what a what a awful thing when uh, they had the power, you know so much in their hands and they're letting it go the women i don't think they had a choice because the men controlled it yeah. because the men uh, the men had control of um, they controlled the women too to some extent the women had power within the household mm -hmm. and so uh, the public spaces were all were always occupied by men so mm -hmm. when the men decided the change had to come and there were a lot of reasons why you know um, they had um, um, uh, uh, um, a lot of it was the uh, european the british influence where the british missionaries came in uh, other communities looked down on the men because along with matrilineality the marriage system of the matrilineal communities was called sambandham where it was a social contract not a religious uh, uh, relation um, uh, religious engagement so um, women could uh, take would have relationships with men and if they were tired or if the brothers thought there was somebody else who was more advantageous to them they could get uh, you know they could change husbands and so um the younger generation of nair men started getting embarrassed because people around them started calling them you know your mother has uh, is a concubine because she has all of these men in her life and so they wanted change and also when uh, and it was initiated largely by the nairs and when nair men went out and got jobs got educated they didn't want to hand over the money to their sisters or their sisters children they wanted to give the money uh, what they earned to their children and according to the old matrilineal tradition they couldn't do that um so it was a combination of a lot of these things and there was pressure from the british for kerala to change because they felt it was a very immoral and corrupt system and that it was important that women be follow the victorian ideal of womanhood mm -hmm. uh, and i think that you said the balachandran was going to speak where is balachandran balachandran are you there i th hello I hello can you hear me yes, yes balachandran yes. we can hear you we can't yes. see you uh, uh, i'm having a connectivity problem here Go okay ahead. yeah uh, so the question i wanted to ask is once the communists came to power in the 50s or so 
and yeah. uh, there was a movement of land to the tiller and uh, many of the mag communities lost all their land did that yeah. change all these relationships in any way uh, relationships within the family yes within the family and the matrilineal uh, thing to whatever extent i think it can't hear you I said Shanti, it probably can't hear contributed to it, but the demise had started um, uh, long before that. Um, because the, mo the moment that law was passed, Seto Lakshmi signed that order in a month of about 3,000 US partition of entire households where men wanted, like, wanted to take their portion of um, their inheritance and leave the family. So I think the demise and then the land reform probably just um, uh, you know pushed it along faster and further. Because when people the Nairs were an agricultural, they're an agri agrarian community. So once you lose land, there's nothing left. And then what happens is the men go out to get jobs, and when they have jobs and they're earning money, they really don't want to share it with the large. Um, about of people, they would rather look after their own interest, and that may lie with a wife and children rather than sisters and nephews. Sisters, that arrangement worked when people lived in um, their lived in their caravans uh, <coughs> in their households. But once they move out, it became difficult. Okay, okay. Mukul wants to uh, ask I a question, and after Mukul, I, I think a... Jyoti also wants to ask a question. Mukul, uh, Pragya, 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 has Pragya, also. Pragya has raised her hand. Okay, Pradya, go ahead. Okay, I'm a sort of uh, interloper. I've just sort of barged in here. I was uh, yesterday at the book launch of Manu Pillai's latest book, invited by one of my former batchmates. And then just by complete serendipity, Bindu Ram Mohan told me about this uh, presentation. My question is the following. You know, this is such a completely unique system and practically, you know, stands alone uh, on the Indian subcontinent. I just wanted to know, is there... Any explanation for the sociological or anthropological reason for why this is so unique to Kerala? There, one theory that has been uh, mooted is that, um, that uh, Nayas were um, a warrior clan. Mm -hmm. And so when you need to uh, in, uh, you know, co-opt people into the army, it's good for them not to have any kind of battle. Um, it also, you know, they could leave without worrying about the position of their uh, wives because they were members of the Taravads, that's the matrilineal household, and the lineage would continue. Um, that is the uh, explanation that is given. I don't, nobody really has a clear idea. Yeah. And it was also encouraged by the Nambudri Brahmins. The way the, ma the marriage system worked was that the Brahmins in Kerala, Kerala's indigenous Brahmins, the Nambudris, only mm -hmm. the oldest male member could marry. And he married, he could marry four or five or six Nambudri women as he wanted. Um, the, all of the younger sons had relationships with Nair and Kshatriya women. So in that way, the Nambudris ensured that their land holdings, uh, their wealth remained intact. Um, because the Nambudri men, uh, the younger sons, uh, did not have to pay uh, support or in any way be connected with the children of their union. It was just um, uh, sexual, probably an economic and social contract because uh, families were hypergamous. They elevated their status and there was when the women had relationships with Namudri men. Um, but where the Namudri households were concerned, there was no division of property because only the oldest male inherited. The people who suffered the most in this arrangement were the Nambudri women because there were not enough men to go around. And, some and the men married multiple wives and it was a patrilineal system. They brought all the wives home to the Illam and, uh, you know, the women just had, uh, it just, and they, you, um, you can uh, come in as the third wife or the fourth wife of a senior Nambudri who probably may have unmarried sisters in the home. Um, and it was very, very difficult. Their lives constricted and constrained, they, they had a difficult uh, life. Nair women, compared to that, had a lot more freedom and you know, control over their lives. There were no husbands involved. 
um, it was just brothers. And, um, and sometimes if the brothers were in the army, they were not there. So the women pretty much had a free reign. But women's bodies, their sexuality was controlled by men across the board. And we see that in the case of the two Sedos. You know, Lakshmi Bai was presented with two men. She wasn't to given a choice. Uh, the um, Maharaja uh, chose the two men and her, probably the mothers, the two mothers had some say in it and said, okay, now pick one. Um, it is not that a woman could uh, take on a, um, um, a, a spouse or, you know, a relationship, go into a relationship. And even if she liked the man, if the brother and the, if her brother and her um, uh, 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 partner had a falling out, the partner had to go. She, she could not, uh, uh, you know, she had no control over that. Um, I did an ethnographic study in the 90s um, where uh, I talked to two generations of women in our household. And there were women in their 70s who had been through the old Sarabad system. And it was interesting. There was the, one of the, a couple of the women made the remark that when, uh, you, you know, Husbands are easier to control than brothers because you have a sexual connection with a, a husband and you can use that to your advantage. He said, with brothers, you have nothing. Okay. Well, you really intrigued me because I'm a, st a student of social and cultural anthropology and I really feel like going further into this. So thanks for arousing the interest. Oh, I just want welcome. to give a quick shout out to Mukul, who's there, whom I haven't yes. seen for I think Mukul was here. Yeah. 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 Hi, I'm, hi, Pragya. Yeah. I'm just giving you my number in here. Let's reach yeah. out. Yeah. Okay. okay, lovely. You can get it from Moini also. I'm not good at, tech, at technology no this way. Okay, yeah. that's fine. go ahead. You have to say yeah. something. Ashanti, I have a question. Uh, yeah. I understand that this, you know, this is the history of, uh, of a certain period in, in Kerala. But what is it that makes this book so great and so well recommended? Can you comment on its style and its readability? And what is it that I, would grip for somebody? Me, I think um, what fascinated me was that I'm from Kerala and I have not, um, it is, um, I have not, like I mentioned in the beginning, you know, the history that I learned in school did not even touch upon Kerala. And uh, what I found fascinating is that uh, Manu Pillai covers a pretty wide area, even though he only deals with the kingdom of Travancore. There are so many layers to the He begins with the Portuguese and he talks about the European influence and how they managed to, how they succeeded in getting a foothold in the state. Um, how the kingdom of Travancore came into being, the role of the, uh, the role of women and the power that of uh, women yielded at some time. Um, so that, and he manages to do that without it being choppy. So all of these different stories uh, sort of seamlessly blend together, even though he moves back and forth between time periods. <coughs> what I found, um, uh, what I uh, found questionable about the book was that it is very heavily tilted in favor of um, uh, uh, Sedu Lakshmi Bai. Um, in fact, he used this, you know, pretty strong language to describe Parvati Bai. And I think all of the documentation, um, and, and, and it is pretty exhaustive. He has about 200 pages of 150 pages of notes. Um, uh, he, he quotes what other people say about Lakshmi Bai and Parvati Bai without ever, uh, there's no analysis of, what was it that made her take all of these measures to have her son instituted as the regent? What was it that created the rift between the two uh, uh, cousins to this extent, where it's you know, sort of down to the level of pettiness? And interestingly, just last year, uh, there's a new book that's come out called History Liberated. And it is by Parvati Bai's uh, granddaughter or great granddaughter, I'm not sure, it's by this woman, Gauri Lakshmi Bai. And she references this book and she says the book has a, a lot of falsehoods and she is setting that, she wants to set the record straight. I haven't read that book yet. I just got a copy of it. I didn't have time to read it. Um, but uh, she says she really wants to set the record uh, straight because she feels that this was a very biased rendering. Of, mm -hmm. uh, and her grandmother has been vilified. There's no doubt about it. You know, they call her the evil woman, you know. Uh, 
I, I, what's, I, what's the period of this book? Just last question. What's the period of this book? When, uh, it, when it is it begins, set? It begins with uh, Vasco da Gama's arrival in the 15th century. And then it goes on till, um, I think, Lakshmi, um, yeah, um, Setu Lakshmi by his death in 1980. So it's a pretty broad um, um, coverage. Though the main focus is the 19th century, the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century, you know, with the adoption. But he goes back and forth. He talks about, you know, he talks about matrilineality and what it meant and why. Um, he talks about a lot of agrarian reforms that she brought about. He talks about the rise of Syrian Christians. Um, so um, that's such on a lot of themes because like I said, my presentation was 30 minutes and uh, it's the, uh, about the ivory throne. I just focused on the two sisters, but you know, we could do an entirely new whole presentation on uh, on matrilineality and the Nairs and all of the Shanti, stuff that went on. Yeah. Uh, uh, Indu Kulkarni is waiting to ask you a question. Okay. Fascinating, but there's only one figure that Lakshmi Bai is quite a tragic figure that yes. she kept to the rituals and she wanted to be progressive at the same time and yes. you know grow with the times and so much of uh, you know human relationship must have been you know kind of torn apart at that time in Kerala. And uh, still the right. people have been so progressive that they have evolved with the times. And if you look at the state, it's like one, of course, the communist government helped to bring it out. But today they are such a progressive state, having controlled the pandemic, having riding the wave of so many changes. But all this on the basis of such a complex uh, caste system mm -hmm. at that yes. time. It was like frightening how, how could people have some freedom or the other. And I think yeah, Manu more, eh, tries to bring it out very honestly. Yeah. Honestly, he tries to bring it out to the best of his ability. His what narrative flows. Uh, Lakshmi Nair, we can hear your conversation. Would you please mute yourself? Okay, uh, I think there's one last qu uh, question uh, from Jyoti. Do you think that a vault in Padma, uh, that a vault in Parmadab Temple still carries the curse, or is it a myth? Shanti can't hear you at all. I said it's a, it's a matter of belief. If you believe in astrology and curses, to those people who do, I'm sure that curse is very real. It's like black okay. magic, you know. And anything, well, well, it's like belief in astrology. It's like belief in astrology, belief in reincarnation. It's a matter of belief. Okay, more take over now. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Gautam. Gautam, Gautam wants to know about the hidden wealth everywhere that is there in the Kerala. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's to, the case. He wants to visit Kerala to go and look for the hidden wealth. In the material, <laughs> let's keep Moini gone. Okay. So I guess uh, we've had... Oh, one minute, one minute, one minute. Moini, one more thing. One yes. minute. Uh, must tell you people that one of our regulars, Meenakshi Alim Chandani, has been asked by the Jaipur Lit Fest to be one of the, uh, not conveners, but what we call, call pre presenters there. So three cheers to her. So, yeah, Meenakshi lives in Toronto and uh, the Jaipur Lit Fest has a Toronto chapter, I gather. Yes. So in, in that, they've asked her to be one of the presenters. So that's great. Um, I have known Meenakshi since she was a student, you know, in my college. Um, okay, so uh, Shanti, I'd like to thank you, first of all, for a very good session. And, uh, you know, of course, you couldn't talk about everything in the book. I mean, that we understand, of course. And you made selections. But from your talk, one can realize you know, how much there is in the book. And I think you've given excellent pointers to the, the main themes, let us say, you know, um, in the content. And a very interesting book, of course. I mean, I did start reading it. And um, I think um, anyone who is interested in history, you know, would love this book 
because it is so it is written in such a style as to be such pleasant reading so it's the opposite of a textbook right so very beautifully written and i'm quite fascinated actually by manu pillai that i mean he's he's such a young man i think he's barely 30 now and he's already brought out what five books plus all the amount of uh, articles and columns and appearances and talks and what not so quite a guy and he's a very good speaker also we heard him at the jlf one year uh, where he was interviewing someone very interesting and a good speaker right so shanti i enjoyed your presentation very very much thank you so much thank you so much for uh, taking the time you know putting in the energy and all the thinking you know to make that selection to point out the main threads uh, in the book very well done and uh, everybody who participated and who asked questions and who listened and who is present um i think we have two people from canada today and shanti of course is from the us and some other people also are always nice to know that we have an audience from various parts of the world um gautam has said ah he said an uh, great he said uh, that's his comment great excellent okay so uh, i will just tell you what to expect next sunday and then i'll hand over to farooq uh next sunday is the 3rd of october we have snowba satara wala talking about tolkien's book the hobbit okay so uh, that is it and the sunday after that we have arthur miller's play the crucible presented by suhail azavedo right uh, okay so thank you everyone farooq over to you yeah thank you thank you shanti for a wonderful presentation and uh, you must have gone to a lot of effort to prepare for today and get up so early in the morning and be ready for the presentation uh, i just want to tell you that next saturday at 7:30 uh, we have invited robert de souza from washington he is going to be he is a wildlife photographer and good friend of satish koth and uh, we are going to be uh, in uh, he is going to speak on uh, camouflage he is a uh, he is a person who you know he he is a person who does photography of Uh, animals and things like that, and uh, I just want to uh, request everybody that they should be there. I I have the presentation, but I am unable to pull it up. He is a wildlife photographer. He has recently been to Arctic, and he has photographed bears catching uh, that fish. What is that fish? Yes, Shanti. Salmon. 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 And he has photographs of uh, butterflies and birds and all. And his topic is how animals, insects, and uh, various reptiles use. come of lunch to save themselves or to hunt so next saturday satish koth will be the host with robert disuza for the program come of lunch so we will be sending you the creators uh, within the next two days and this program that you have today will be available live on facebook immediately after this program and we'll probably put it on youtube by monday monday evening so i think from my side uh, thanks to everybody and uh, with your permission satish we can close the program Yes, thank okay. you very much, hey. thank you, Farooq, and yeah. all the best to you, Shanti. We enjoyed the program, thank you. and there will be many more such talk coming from you. Thank you, everyone. All the best. Thank you. And okay, thanks, thanks to Abid. Abid is always yes. there to help us. Thanks to Abid and thanks to Tushar. Tushar. Now Tushar is here right now. Thank you. But uh, you You're know, there. the support comes from both these people. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much, both of you. Thank you thank you Oini huh thank you bye bye good thank evening you.